SIP episode 106, all clones are not created equal, especially when it comes to Dijon clones and those of Pinot Noir fame. We are sitting down in this episode with Ali Ketchum and Renee Graves of Ketchum Winery Estates in the Russian River Valley to talk all things clone, Pinot Noir, sparkling, and rosé, and potentially a little mention of a band that knows a thing or two about community, hence the shirt. Sit back. SIP episode 106 begins now. Well, welcome everyone. This is SIP episode 106. My name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Seller Angels. In 2010, we decided to found online a direct-to-consumer wine company where we showcase and specialize and feature the greatest wines coming out of Napa and Sonoma right now, where you can taste the thrill. And uh, it's been going on 12 years now. We started SIP at the beginning of the pandemic because we're a big believer in community. So Chad, hello again. Dahlia, how are you doing? Donna, good to see you. And there's another Jan, Jim B, who I'm also going to see next week. Karen, Karen's getting ready for a big old trip out to wine country. That is outstanding. Peter, good to see you. Ron, Sean, M, great to have you in the house. Very excited to see everyone. I want to get through a couple of housekeeping items, which are near and dear to both me and our current guests. Just to give you an idea, Sipsters, of how big a role you're playing in people's lives. I'm going to do some reading, which I know you're not supposed to do on screen. Both the Shawshank Redemption and the Big Lebowski bombed. If bombed means that during the first few weeks, no one went to a theater to see them, then you are correct. Since then, tens of millions of people continue to talk about these movies. Tommy James, Tommy James and the Shondells, for, the, for those of you that didn't grow up in the 40s and 50s and 60s, First record was an absolute failure. No sales, no songs played until someone at a DJ in Pennsylvania decided to start playing the songs. Now I'll put a hundred points in the first person who can give me a Tommy James and the Shondell songs. Uh, you know them. They had seven top tens in their career in the first five years. We are primed as citizens and community to pay attention to thunderclaps, but great success like great wine doesn't happen immediately. The events that change our culture often happen over time, distributed across parts of the population too small to even notice. The Grateful Dead were the number one touring live band more years than any other band, yet they only had one top 10 hit in their 40 years. The first challenge that we have is finding focus and patience on the things that matter. The second is to not sacrifice that focus and patience to the thunderclap of immediacy. Drip by drip makes a wave. And Sipsters, you are contributing to the wave. Uh, by the way, uh, Crimson and Clover, Tommy James and the Shondell song. Uh, there's a couple other ones. Uh, my baby, that's the last thing I'm going to be doing because I know you all know the words to that. So uh, for those of you that have a glass of your wine or the Ketchum Estates, I want to show you how you're getting that wine. And it happens to be uh, not up on my board right now. So let me get over there. Where we go? Still not sharing. Bear with me. Yes. So when you go to the Cellar Angels website, you will see very quickly that it is catering to folks that know their way around wine country and appreciate luxury. That's us. Uh, limited production wines and tonight's guest is no different. But what you can do is go to the shop wine, click on that, and you will see that the marketplace appears before you. The marketplace is where we have a sip kit. This wine, these two wines, by the way, that are in the sip that we'll be drinking tonight, were in the sip kit several weeks ago. This is a collection of premium Napa and Sonoma wines, and we're going to be tasting these wines over the next four or five Fridays. So if you want to participate and have a heck of a good time and learn a great deal about wine with the winemaker themselves, grab yourself a sip kit. You can also grab any bottles you want off the marketplace. These are all limited production. And as we like to say, no different than tonight's guest, look, mom, no barcode, because these aren't in the distribution channel. So you're not going to find these at stores for the most part, but that's exactly where you can get them on the Seller Angels page. And for those of you that open up an account, uh, I encourage you to check out your account profile because it is the gold mine of things to do with regards to telling you where everything resides. So I've got 38,000 loyalty points. I have several shipping addresses. I have several wine clubs that I'm in with Seller Angels. Anything that I need to do is right here on the left-hand menu. 
So you will never be lost when you get to the Seller Angels page, not only great wines, but great stories and simple loyalty rewards, news and announcements. Everything you need is on your My Account page. So I'm going to stop sharing now because I want to drink wine with two guests tonight from Catch in the States. And this is going to be your opportunity to meet in person, Allie Ketchum and Renee Groffs. Ladies, thank you. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Cheers. 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 All of the guests, Jeff and Jane, I know 38,000 points. It, it's good to be the king. A lot of purchasing going on. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, we also stayed on Ketchum Estate and meeting Mark and Allie. It was inspirational. So glad to be a part of this. Brian, that you Thanks rock. For thank you in. for being a part of this. So we want to talk a little bit about all things catch and mistakes. And to do that, let's go to Allie. So Allie, I know there's uh, some Midwestern roots. So let's go way back before catch him. And was there ever a time where you thought you would be in wine, let alone have a winery? Well, I, I see um, some of the very first friends in my life are logged in, and that's Linda and David Backrack, and they live down the street from my parents. And oh, Linda geez. and David actually had a wine rack in their house, which my parents probably served the box Fonzia, <laughs> where Linda and David actually served um, luscious, delicious, um, probably more French wines than Californian. But but that's how, you know, it was like the people like David, who gave me my very favorite in very first Caesar salad. And they, they taught me about the, the luxury of living well and, and kind of planted that seed. Although I never, never in my wildest dreams could have imagined that here I would be um, on a vineyard in the Russian river. Yeah, and it's a, it's a special place. The vineyard part of it is behind me. So for those of you in the chat that have actually been there, you know what a magical place it is. And for us, wine country in itself is magical. Having grown up in the Midwest, uh, Chicago all my life, I still think it's a cathartic experience when we drive across the Bay Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge. There's just something ab about it that is just magical. So to have this place be your home is amazing. And Renee, same question. How did you find yourself getting into the wine industry? Well, I, I grew up, um, I, was, I was lucky enough to grow up in Healdsburg, California. And so it's kind of always been part of my world and my life. Um, although when you're a kid growing up in wine country, you have no idea who your friends' parents are, that you know, you're, the, the wine that you might be smuggling out of someone's cellar <laughs> when you're a teenager might be, you know, Gary Farrell or whatever. <laughs> You have no idea. And so it just kind of was always part of um, part of my life. Um, and I moved away for long enough to realize that I really like our heart and soul was here. Um, my husband's from Michigan, as is Allie. Um, and so there's there's a lot of you know, Michiganders that um, end up in California. And so my husband said, let's settle down in California. And so we just kind of stuck around here. Yeah. Not a bad place to stick around. And yeah. I understand I understand getting out of Michigan for about four or five months out of the year as well. It, it has the winters are much more hospitable here. You don't that's need to use a credit card to scrape the ice off your windshield. No, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly, well, you know the credit card trick. It's, it's oh my always, goodness, without gloves. And, yeah. <laughs> no, no, thank you. I don't miss no those gracias. days. Yeah, yeah. So Allie, undergrad was where? I went to Denison University in Ohio, where I studied um, literature and art, and that took me to Oxford for a semester, where I was able to, to study the same thing in England. So I graduated college with this liberal arts degree and um, really had no idea what to do with myself. And back in the Midwest, it wasn't one of those. It, you didn't find vintners at the, the job fairs, and I knew I wasn't cut out to be an insurance broker or a, a banker. Um, so I, I kind of had wanderlust and, and traveled the world as much as I could in those early years. And then how'd you get out to California? And I'm sensing there was some romance involved. <laughs> yeah, it's always like, I, I, I have this tendency to not really plan too much ahead or, or um, oh, but follow my heart. So after graduating college, um, I wound up 
hiking the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine. I took a through hike and started down south and had a backpack and it took me six and a half months to walk from Georgia to Maine. And up towards the end, up in Maine, I met a boy, his name's Paul Jameson, and he invited me to run away with him. And I said, okay, Paul, where are we off to? And his brother had a boat in Sausalito. And so I wound up going back home for a little bit. And then come February, it was, it was Valentine's Day of um, 1999. I bought a one-way ticket to San Francisco from Detroit and had nothing but my backpack filled with what I needed. Um, and, and wound up living on a boat in Sausalito. And I'll tell you, going from having to scrape your windshield with a credit card to a view of the San Francisco skyline and sunny degree sunshine was, was absolutely, um, I've never looked back on that moment. That is outstanding and quite a unique experience going from Detroit to Sausalito and Sausalito is one of those places also that most Midwesterners will stop at on their way up to the valley to have lunch and stuff like that because exactly. it's a uh, really magical little quaint little place. Yes, it is. Sure is. Um, all right, so you're in why you're in Sausalito. Yeah, and yeah. I'm I'm curious. What did you go north with this gentleman to wine country? Or? No, so so well, the boat sunk and the relationship sunk, and um, <laughs> <laughs> and I was working as a nanny at the time. I've always loved children, and I found being a nanny was just the best job because I had all these wonderful Marin County mothers that I was working for, and they were had they it was this just beautiful community of moms and kids, and I would take care of like neighborhoods. And um, one of the moms I was working for, I, I was in my early 30s and she was bound and determined to set me up with a husband. So she set me up on a number of wine dates, um, the third being Mark Ketchum. And he invited me over to his home before going out to dinner at Michael Mina's Aqua restaurant. And well, um, before we were going out to dinner, he poured me a glass of his newly made by Michael Brown from Costa Brown Pinot Noir. And I swore it was the best wine I'd ever had in what, my what life. What vintage was it? It was 05. So it was the five. first commercial vintage. This was 07 that I met Mark, beginning of 07. And I said, Mark, you know, I've never had a wine that's so delicious. I, I had no idea that wine could taste so good. And um, we went and had dinner at Michael Mina. They wound up putting the tables, the chairs upside down. And they, I remember having Sauterne paired with Fagua for the first time in my life. And um, Mark was a bit older than I was and super sophisticated and had just this um, Renaissance outlook on life and a taste for the good life. And he shared yeah, that with you. When you have sauternes and foie gras for the first time, you realize you are never drinking Bartles and James again. No, <laughs> no more white zin. No so. more white zin. The Lancers isn't going to cut it. No more Franzia. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was that was quite an indoctrination. Very smart man. Yeah, yeah. So, so we wound up um, moving up here. He had um, bought this property in 2000 and replanted a lot of the vineyard. Um, and um, the house he had, he said it was a very pedestrian ranch house at the time he bought it. So he did a complete remodel where he kept the fireplace, kept the um, footprint of the house and called it a remodel. And it took him about three years to finish that. So we were able to move into the home together. We started having children. We have a daughter, Savannah, who was born in 08, and a son, Nick, who was born in 2010. And we raised our, we've raised our kids on this vineyard. They were people who've been tasting here a while, can remember seeing the kids running naked through the vineyard, bare feet, um, and it's always been just a family place. So now Savannah and Nick are pirating stuff out of the cellar like Renee they was. Are, right? Oh my God. I, I discovered <laughs> a, a, bunch of, on the of a bunch of Cahiva cigars that went missing the other day. And oh, that's awesome. So how did you two meet? Pardon? How did you two meet? Renee and I? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, Renee. So, so we were, it was, um, I had just had Nick. So Nick was born December of 2010. He was like a month old. And, not and, even. and we needed some help with some bookkeeping. So I put it out on Facebook and funny enough, two of my friends, my Facebook friends responded with, um, yeah, Renee Graves. So we invited Renee over and she felt like 
home. So, so Renee's been kind of my sister, the mother to my children, my BFF, my travel buddy, oh. my adventurer, my business manager, my director of happiness. And she really, um, she really gives a lot of heart to this, to this one. That's super cool. And I also think it's kind of interesting too, Renee, because you can kind of mentor slash shepherd, you know, Savannah and Nick as a child of a winery who having grown up in that capacity yeah. and say, okay, uh, stay out of the police blotter. That's not good. <laughs> uh, you, I, <laughs> goals life yeah, goals. exactly <laughs> life goals words absolutely. of wisdom yeah absolutely Perfect. so i want to throw up a poll question because uh i like uh, karen i agree with you titled director of happiness is about as good as it gets it uh, is. and you know i i um i don't know i i walk through life whether it's the good the bad or the ugly and with a smile on my face and i just i like to make things happen and i like to make people happy so Mark, Mark granted me that title director of happiness about eight years ago. And, um, there's not a lot of things I say are absolutely perfect, but that, that she works up to it. Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, I want to, we're going to talk about clones, but clones are very important to understand where they came from, how they got here. So some um, of the Ketchum clones are defined as, and here's a gentleman trying to get on the plane and looking at some overhead storage. So this goes back a ways, but are they suitcase clones, underwear clones, Concord clones? Uh, and I'm going to take a sip of the rosé of Pinot Noir that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, I'll say hello to Ron. Two Rons. Haven't Ron said hello to Ron. Hi, Ron. <laughs> Monique. Mark. I th Mark, I sent you an email, I think, this week. Lori, good to see you. Laquetta, very good to see you. Kathleen, for those of you that are new, I can't say last names because we get in trouble. Um, you all know your last name. Okay. All right. I'm so sorry, sorry. this is going to be five, four, three, two, one. So for those of you that said suitcase clones, suitcase clones, I promise you, I haven't been drinking yet. Uh, you are wrong in this particular instance. Could get partial credit for that. But Ali, why don't you tell us about the origin of some of the vines and the relationship to a lesser known clone, the underwear clone? <laughs> and yes, and I, the, I could stand corrected because this is a story Mark liked to tell and it's a legend um, or it's, it's a, yeah. Um, so he's always shared that our A28 clone, A28 clone um, was originally um, Jeff Pizzoni, who is one of the, the founders of, um, of Pinot Noir in the Russian River Valley. He was over in the Burgundy region. Um, and apparently, as, as legend has it, he, he took some of the clone off of the 828 in Burgundy and put it in his underwear and smuggled it to the United States. So we call it the underwear clone, um, but um, that's, that's our story. <laughs> That's a, that's a good story. I like it. Uh, the two case clones are, are long known. I'm going to throw a uh, link in the chat. That's uh, I'd grab that for a little bit later because we've had, we've gone deep on clones on seller angels in one of the previous SIP episodes. And we talked about foundation and plant services, you know, all the Dijon clones, there's 45 different Dijon clones, 828, Pomard, 777. They're all part of the Dijon clones. And it does sound like a grateful dead story. <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> So, but that's an interesting link with regards to clones. It's, and also it would probably surprise people that the first clones that came over from Burgundy actually landed in Oregon. So now you understand a little bit why Willamette has such great uh, Pinot Noir. All right, second question. Uh, for those of you, by the way, we had one person with the underwear clone. So uh, on our system, who, who was that in the chat that got that? Now we're drinking the rosé and this gives you a little bit of an insight into really how crazy rosé growth has been. So in 2010, there were in the United States, 149,000 cases of rosé sold. It represented fewer than 7% of total sales. In 2020, 10 years later, how many cases of rosé have been sold? Mm, that's a great question. And by the way, if I see anybody looking it up on a smartphone, 10 demerits and you get kicked out of the chat. <laughs> We're going to give this one five, 
four, three, two, one. So we've got answers all over the board. So even 650,000 would be a huge increase from uh, 149,000. Allie or Renee, you want to fathom a guess? We did. We guessed, we, we kind of did our SAT thing where you go with the, the third third question. <laughs> we thought it was 1.69, yeah. but. We'll uh, 2.3 million. 2.3 wow. million, that's amazing. That is 2.3 absolutely. million in 10 years, it's like a 1400% increase or something like that. I mean, it's just our, absolutely crazy. Our 125 <laughs> cases. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know. We barely put a drop, drop in, that. in that. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. But still, uh, let's talk about, I want to talk about pivots because life obviously, and Renee, I, I loved your example earlier where you try to go from moment to moment to moment with a, a smile on your face, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. And, and we all face a little bit of each dependent upon the day. So from a pivot standpoint, I know we're gonna talk about the Pinot pivot, but actually you had a huge pivot in 2020 with the passing of, of Mark, but Mark was also instrumental in instilling in uh, you, Ali and Renee and your winemaker. He really wanted a lot more women involved in the business. Talk to me, Ali, a little bit about that. Well, Mark had this thing about empowering women, and I, I think he he wanted he 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 was twenty years older than me, and he knew he was sick, and he wanted to make sure that it was this business was something that that we would be able to carry on going forward. Um, so we hired Tammy Collins as our winemaker. She we had um, Michael Brown, and then we had Gary Farrell, and and hmm. and we wound up with with Tammy Collins, and we just think she's absolutely phenomenal. She was our friend before she was our winemaker. She's a fellow, a fellow mama like us. She yeah, has, we all have kids the same. We all ages, have two so. kids, so we're two kids. So we like to say we we we're mamas making wine for mamas who like to drink wine, but we we love the daddies too. And um, but yeah, Mark has always tried to empower women as as best he can. And so uh, part of our philanthropy is really focused on um, children and. And in 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 women, um, and we we just we have a, a super progressive stance on. on yeah, and, and it really was it was really one of those things that was clear for me from the from the early days of working with Mark that he he um, those that knew him he was a larger than life character um, that no one would ever dream of of double crossing, and he really um, really made it so that we had um you know the power and the authority that if someone were to, if i was you know looking at a certain wine barrel that we wanted to buy and kind of was getting hassled by you know a, a salesman um he would you know basically say nope you got to deal with renee like he mm -hmm. wouldn't put up with any anyone trying to get around me to get to him he would mm -hmm. just say you know it's renee's decision renee can mm -hmm. renee's got the you know renee knows what's going on mm -hmm. and so it was wonderful as you know time progressed and Mark was getting sicker um, and sicker over the years, um, he really spent a lot of time like helping Allie come in to be this amazing businesswoman and um, owner and like just the deeper knowledge of the business end of the winery, not just the, the hosting the and hosting entertaining, and entertaining which I right. love to do. So, and it's been wonderful. I've loved being able to have her by our sides when Tammy and I are working on wine blends and, you know, we were in the vineyard this morning sampling grapes. So Mark just really took that and like really gave us a good foundation for it. Super nice. And, and I like it. And it's, I mean, another pivot you talk about is, and by the way, Cellar Angels, huge advocates of women winemakers, uh, female vignerons. I mean, we had last week, Jacqueline Renee, who makes Pinot Noir and Chardonnay Wonderful. in the Russian River Valley. Yeah. We have Stephanie Trotter. We had Sue McNerney. We have, I mean, some of the Sipsters can uh, mention quite a few of them. Love what you bring to the industry. I think we need more of it. And quite honestly, I actually think women are better tasters than men. So uh, certainly better knows. I joke around and it's the sipsters know, I mean, men grow up the first 20 years of their lives. They know about five aromas. It's like locker room, cut grass, <laughs> cut wood, gasoline, and something else. Um, fireworks. Uh, and fireworks. <laughs> yeah. And burnt rubber from car tires. Gun I mean, it, 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 and gunpowder, exactly. And firecracker <laughs> residue. And 
really they're not evolved from from a olfactory sense of smell but boy women get it early and, and they expand on it and it's outstanding so i'm thrilled that mark um was able to not indoctrinate you but certainly uh educate and, and bring that pivot about uh, i'm curious what did mark do for a living for a living? Well, he started his um, his career in software and he got his master in compu computer science from Princeton and he went on to develop a company called Catchcom, which was a free internet system that would, um, and I, I wish I knew more of the nuts and bolts of the, the system, but it would um, connect large corporations like government, um, prisons, hospitals, um, universities, law offices, law offices um, and it was kind of Super a cool. free internet payroll slash um, email sort of provider and that became obsolete in the mid 90s. So then he bought his first Ferrari, which um, he, Mark, um, he, Mark was just this, um, this character and he loved the the best things in life. So he bought a Ferrari. An old vintage one. No, not, no, it was oh actually yeah. a current a one. one. It was a current okay. one. It was kind of like the Christy Brinkley one from oh. um from, oh, yeah. from Vacation. Um, vacation. Yeah, it was I, I don't know if it was a 480 or I, I, I don't know exactly the car, but he was driving he played golf at the Olympic Club in San Francisco and he was driving his clubs down to play golf and someone stopped him on the side of the road and offered him like 20 grand more than what he actually paid for the car. He's like, I don't want to sell it. But then he's like, well, you know, that's easy money. And then he got really into um, the history behind cars and, and, and for, um, for, Ferraris were his, his true specialty, but he had such a wide scope of post-war racing cars that, um, that he, um, that, that he, um, I'm sorry, that, um, that he, became this major historian and it's actually car week this weekend at Pebble Beach and that was always That's a right part of, that was always a big part of um we go down every year often we'd show cars um what towards the end of his life he bought a Lancia Stratos which are just these um it was a, a rally car um and we raced that well, he, he was Italy. I mean I, th I think to call him an aficionado of cars is an understatement. Yeah, I mean, it was, is. I mean, he was really top of his game. He had clients um, like Bill Marriott and, and you know, just people, people have some of the best car collections in the world that he's, he's helped um, amass their collection. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, some of the research and, and reading just how gifted of a trader of cars and auctions and, and knowing sure. the details of the car and the value of the car he was sure. truly uh, a skill. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So since we're talking about pivots, not only in, in life, but there's also pivots in the wine industry. And yes. so the rosé, tell us about the rosé that we're drinking right now, because I know we're drinking the 19, but there was also a pivot in 20. Yeah, well, let me let me tell you first that feeds into the the the, the clone. So that the wine that you have in your glass is made um, from 100 percent of our 828 clone off of our West Block. It was always the the block in the vineyard that was the last to ripen. I always felt like we were waiting and waiting and waiting, and I was putting off harvesting other blocks so it would come along enough. And in 2016, Mark decided um, that he was going to have us add a rosé to the program, and it's named after um, Savannah, whose middle name happens to be Rose. Yeah. So and oh, she wow. was very insistent on having her own wine, and she wanted it to be pink. So and then next year she didn't like pink anymore. <laughs> we left it with pink. Yeah, we didn't um, want to dye the wine blue, but yeah. So so that's so it's a full it's it's full um a full it's an eight to eight clone Pinot Noir rosé that you're drinking um that we pick um, those grapes specifically to make this wine. We they go straight into um, a whole cluster press, and that's a little bit about the, the wine you have in your glass. So then I'll let you go with it. Well, and, and we're getting ready. Um, so rosé is always the first thing we pick and we're gonna actually harvest this on Tuesday. We've got our crew coming in and just today we were out checking the sugar levels and lo and behold, they are ready. It is time. Um, so Renee and I went through and we picked and we brought a little, um, a, oh. little a little um, um, cluster for you all to see. Um, 
that the pinot clusters are fairly small and they're fairly tight and the the fruit is is super juicy and super delicious um so yeah um rosé has been a really fun project the aging process is only nine months and um so so wines that instead of like our pinots we age for 18 months um they're, they're quick so so right now we're just starting to drink our 21s um that's what we have as our current releases and um and and it's just it's a super fun project for us and and we like to think of it as a delicious southern wine or summer sipper or just one of those that you can enjoy for for a long time well and renee let's get into the vineyards and uh for those of you mission control is allowing you to turn on your cameras so hopefully you are zoom appropriate and zoom attire appropriate but when you took over or when Mark acquired the property, what was here and then what's there now? Okay, so when Mark purchased this property, um, the, half the vineyard was Chardonnay and half of it was Pinot Noir. Um, and he wanted ABC, anything but Chard. Um, and, and there also were clone, Pinot Noir clones that he didn't care for here. Um, and so he tore out 75% of the vineyard, leaving um, the oldest Pomard Four block, which we still are using today. It's called, we call it the old Pomard block. And I, it's um, like almost 50 years old now. And, and wow. visually it's, if you look on your screen and you look down where the, uh, the Cellar Angels logo is, that's the, the farthest edge of the, the vineyard property. And that's where um, those clones, those clones are. Um, and so he replanted with um, the Dijon, clones, the Dijon Pinot Noir clones, um, 828-777-115 and 627. Six, six, or six, seven. 626, excuse six, me. Okay, 667. 667. <laughs> Let's get that right. So we, we keep saying it in incorrect, and now I'm going to fumble over mm -hmm. it myself. <laughs> I know, all these we, numbers. All good. To, trying to correct it. You know, yeah. nothing, nothing interesting, but yeah. yeah. Um, not getting the clone numbers right, literally a first world problem. <laughs> yes. I know, I know. <laughs> Perfect. That's awesome. Uh, Brian, good to see you. Look at all these pretty faces. Uh, I'm going to cheers to all these folks. This is outstanding. Oh, yeah. So the, the thing that's interesting to me is he didn't like Chardonnay and you're in pristine Chardonnay territory. We are. Yeah. And he, he didn't, he didn't dislike it per se, but, but we we're Pinot people and we wanted um we we knew that we wanted to do a white wine and we wanted something that's a little different and and Viognier we found grows really beautifully in the Russian River as well so mm -hmm. back when we were wanting to um, start a, a white wine we ended up going for Viognier and that's when Michael Brown was our winemaker and he directed us to the vineyard that we still use to this day and they're really small local about five acres we get about six uh, four to five ish tons off of it every year so and the grapes don't look like this they look like these long kind of craggly spotted looking um funky looking grapes but we we really think the the fruit that we get from those is absolutely superb. So we're happy with, we're just super happy with our Viognier program. Well, that's, and Viognier, you're right, from the Russian River Valley is stunning. Uh, one of the beautiful aromatic varietals and it's just such a crisp, clean wine. It's it's so good from Russian River. I, I love it. So I'm, I can't wait to get some of that, which leads me to query, share with us the portfolio. And I know we're drinking rosé right now, but what are we looking at uh, from a skew offering and case production? Um, well, we make about 140 cases of this um, of this rosé. Um, we make a similar amount of the Viognier. Um, we did make Chardonnay for several years, and um, our most recent year was the 2019. Um, and then we have about, just depending on the year, four to five different Pinots um, that we're able to make, um, and they're all quite different. And that that's really what makes it fun is because we have these five different clones growing on the vineyard. We're able to, they each have their own distinct flavors and personalities. So we're really able to make a uh, um different um wines that that showcase each of those clones um and then we started in 2018 making a cabernet sauvignon which we named cabernet after <laughs> our dear director of happiness so so that's pretty much our portfolio 
Awesome. And we're going to start and sparkling with this year. We're going to introduce, we're going to um, start making sparkling. So a very teeny bit, a little bit of sparkling just so we can um, have a celebratory wine. Awesome. And uh, Hans and Caitlin, good to see you. I'm glad Amazon delivered a camera. So um, awesome. And I had a question. Savannah has her name on a bottle. Is Nick feeling left out? No, he has a bottle as well. We have a bottle we call Nick's Cuvée, and it's a very small, like four barrel blend. Tell the story. Um, and it used to be Savannah and Nick's Cuvée back before Savannah insisted on her um, on her own wine. So this is from back in the day. And she didn't actually get to this one yet. But Savannah used to go around and in a gold pen, she would X out her name. And she said she just doesn't want to share a bottle with her brother. She wants her own. But Therefore, she didn't readily admit that. It was probably a good like couple of months for before we figured it out. We would just like it would all, on every single bottle in the wine cellar. It was all scribbled out. Any case good she could find, oh. she could scribble out <laughs> her own name because she didn't want to share. So, so most we, little kids are writing on the wall or the cabinet. <laughs> She's down in the cellar crossing off her name from the wine. Exactly. Box. Yes, exactly. Cases and cases. Cases and cases. And these so, beautiful hand painted. Yeah, hand painted. Hand -painted. And yeah, this one didn't do it, but but we have several down in the cellar that we just um, think is, is such a little fun bit of our history. Is this, I'm with Hans that. and Caitlin, normally uh, producers will sell signed bottles by the vintner. Now you can sell crossed off bottles by Savannah and they yeah. charge top yeah. dollar for them. Maybe some of y'all have some of those. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's an absolute collector's item. I like it. Yeah. So you, you, you just talked a second ago about the, the different aspects of the different clones and what they bring to kind of each final bottling. And I'm curious, and I'll start with you, Allie. Food, food pairings, you know, flavors, aromas, profile. What are some of the items that you that you just absolutely gravitate towards when you're opening up a certain bottle of Ketchum Pinot? Well, oh, Pinot, gosh, you know, my my kind of standard dish that I, I serve a lot of guests is the chicken paillard, which, which is, is amazing. So um, there used to be a restaurant in Healdsburg called Bistro Ralph. And that was where Mark, the first restaurant Mark took me to um, on our second or third date when he first took me up to wine country to show me. And he's like, you've got to have this chicken paillard. And it's basically a pounded chicken breast that's breaded and then fried in a in a pan and then you make a sauce out of capers lemon shallot um it's, it's a super simple recipe and you can google ali ketchum's um chicken pie art online and it has been published um and and I feel like that's a great pairing because there's a lot of there's some apple cider vinegar in that so that acids from from that sauce pair really beautifully with the the fruit in this wine. But I think Pinot is such an amazing grape because it goes well with sushi, it's great with salads. We had a tasting here this afternoon and we did a little um, um, like a, a breaded cracker with a feta and just nectarines off the nectarine tree. And it's amazing how, how I think Pinot pairs with fruit, Pinot pairs with fish, Pinot pairs with duck. I read today, it's like Pinot pairs with the, the sea being the fish, the land being the um, like venison or cow, um, the air being quail and um what was the other one? Um, like the the river, like like um, yeah. it, it just. It, I think it's such a diverse fruit that is great with cheese. It's great with um, you can you know whatever you feel like eating, um, as long as it's. Mark always said not hot and spicy because hot and spicy can't really take the um, the the and food knocks, of yeah, it knocks, knocks it, it out. Aromatic. But aside right. from that, it, I think it's just a, a really great pairing with so much food. Uh, it, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, especially good Pinot. There is a lot of what I refer to as candied Pinot or Pinot mm -hmm. that yeah. just has that very sweet taste. And, and Pito, a Pinot, true to its varietal, it will never be that sweet. Right. And But it should pair with a variety of foods. And that's why I, I give all the Sipsters and those in the Cellar Angels community great compliments because you have to have the courage to go out and find the good Pinots. And it's yeah. very easy to drink mass produced wines, uh, but you got to chisel away at the mass production and get to the good stuff because the good stuff is extremely food friendly. And like you said, Ali, a variety of foods. Um, I do want to bring attention to Jeff and Jane is asking about Scotland and because we opened up two bottles and that was named after Scotland 
who's not on right now. And this is the second time Scotland has missed a Scotland. So oh, I think that winners need to be present. I think we're going to have to rename this. Uh, so I, I agree, Jane. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to the second wine. Yeah, now, yeah we just, we pour just poured it for ourselves here. And this so, is our Ketchum Vineyard 2019. And okay. A little bit along the, the lines of um, what to echo what Ali was saying with um, how you know these pinots go with um, food so well. So you're drinking the 2019 Ketchum Vineyard Pinot Noir. It's a little confusing. We have four pinots. The first one we we simply call our five clone, which is just a really nice mix of all of the clones out of our vineyard. It's real modern California style. And then the backbone of the Pinot that you're drinking right now is actually out of that old Pomard four block. And so mm. it's, it's got a completely unique flavor. It's the, the it's very Burgundian, with, yeah, it's earthy. The old, old world flavor profiles to it. And really each of our Pinots are kind of built around our different clones to really exhibit different flavor profiles. And so we think that's part of what helps our, our Pinots pair with so many different foods um, it's because we just have such variety within our clones and what we're able to do in the cellar. It does have a certain cotton brief element to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Underwear. <laughs> Underwear. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I don't know if it's boxers or briefs, but there's a certain uh, Burgundian funk. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of earth. There's a lot of um, we have this uh, little eucalyptus tree at the end of the property that kind of gives it some of that sprucey quality. And um, this is what I call my book club wine because it's the one I want to bring to my book club. And this is the one that we open when we have guests over. It's just kind of my, my um, every night drinker. And we love this wine. This is Mark's very favorite. Um, and mm. it, we, it's made primarily with these grapes that are about 50 years old. So you know, as, as we all age, we get a little dried up and we maybe don't produce as much juice, but the juice we have is, is pretty uh -huh. darn wonderful. And, uh, and a little where bit did this, cool where did this show day, just you know? go? Get your minds out of the gutter there. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, but at any rate, we, um, so, so we don't get as much fruit from the Pomard 4 clone, but, but w w the stuff is super concentrated and super delicious. So, so we find a little goes a long way and we just, we, um, is 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 the old world Burgundian? So it's very much like a, a black cherry, chocolate, a, a, some stone fruit, a little. Yeah, we just yeah. We, we just say it's like deliciousness in a glass. Yeah, and we were really no, proud yeah. of this twenty nineteen. Um, this 2019 wine from the Press Democrat, which is the Sonoma County paper, they put on a huge wine competition and they named this one um, the best of the class. So the best of the Pinots that were in that price point and they gave it a 97 points. And, wow, and very good, us, congratulations. Getting that in, in that kind of um, setting, um, although it, it's, you know, it's really, it's like everyone, everyone that we know in the, in the wine business, we all put our wines in there. It's like competing yeah. against, we competed against all of our friends and came out on top. So we were pretty proud of it. Super cool. You know, and we talked earlier about pivots and a couple of weeks ago, we had Lise Asamont on who is yeah. the proprietress of Dot Wine and yeah. great viticulturist. And we were talking specifically about rosé. And she said, a lot of people, it's very rare to make rosé intentionally where you are actually, because because you, you could make Pinot Noir, right? And it would yield much more economic benefit than making mm -hmm. rosé out of it. Um, but there's also times where circumstantially you have to make rosé. And I think you had one of those circumstances. We absolutely did. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't circumstantial. It was more, um, we were halfway through harvest and Mark said to Tammy and I, um, I, want, I, I want you guys to you know, do a rosé. And Tammy and I looked at each other and we're like, we're, we're beyond, we're, we're beyond picking grapes specifically to make rosé. Um, and so we tried a little run at using um, some leftover juice after we had pressed off our reds to try and make a, a rosé. And that was in 2015. And um, we tried it and Tammy and I both were like, mm, it's not quite right. We brought it to Mark and Allie and it was like, we knew that if we were going to put our name on a rosé, we wanted it to be and amazing. Yeah. So it definitely Good. was, um, you know, we've, we've definitely gone the, the route of making sure it's like, it's intentional that, that we're making. And Lisa's amazing. She's, 
um, my neighbor and one of my good friends and a, an amazing winemaker. Everything she touches is fantastic. Yeah, she's, um, as they say in Boston, wicked smart. She's wicked smart. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And just an absolute soul of a person too. Yes. Heart of gold. Now, wasn't there a situation in 2020 where uh, Na Mother Nature said oh, you're going to yeah. be doing another yeah. pivot? And that was another source of pivot. So I was back in Ann Arbor with my family and it was getting towards time that we were having to come home for school. Um, and yeah, we had lost Mark that, that year. And I see that there's fires, the lightning strike fire, which hit, it was, you know, how horrific to have a lightning storm without any rain. So essentially California is as parched as it can be. And this lightning strike hit. And I, I think there were 300 or so fires in the state of California at that time. And one of them happened to be, it was on the other side of the Russian river from us. So it hit around um, Guerneville, but then our friends on West side, West Dry Creek, um, they, it, they felt they, they had a lot of, um, a lot of huge damage there. So this was right around, I think we were set, the fires hit on a Friday and we had already planned to harvest on a Sunday. But the way our vineyard works is because it's, it's 11 and a half acres and because it's different clones and different sunlight, you don't harvest it all at the same time. Um, so we had planned to get the rosé up in, in a couple other blocks that, that Sunday morning, but then uh, the fire hit and um, we were under forced evacuation. I'm crying to Renee and she's like, don't come back out. Yeah, Allie was still in Michigan. And she's like, don't I'm, bother coming back. I'm watching, fire, no I'm watching fire from the hillside, stay in Michigan. <laughs> yeah, don't come back. So, so Renee managed to, we had to get um, a, a, a order that we could pass the evacuation line. We had a crew signed up and they came and they harvested We've never taken in half of the vineyard at once. It was like we oh, harvested like 30 tons that day. And Renee was kept sending pictures of burnt leaves that were, you know, embers of burnt leaves that were raining down on the on the crew. And there was the glow of the fire. But then wow. we had um, another half of the vineyard that still needed to be harvested. And some of it was ready and some of it wasn't ready. So um, we've just finished bottling our 2020 and we weren't able to make the Ketchum Vineyard that year because that Pomard 4 clone was amongst those, those grapes that weren't ready to be picked. And we knew that if we let the grapes sit on the vines too long, that they get smoke taint, which ends mm -hmm. up ruining equipment in the cellar. It ruins barrels and it makes the wine. So it's just not something that we want to drink or put our name on. So we ended up um, sacrificing about half of our vineyard in 2020. And then we're, we're blending and we were able to get some great barrels. So we have Allie's Reserve. We don't have as much of it, but we have Allie's Reserve because Allie's Reserve is always our our top barrels. So typically it's about a 10 barrel blend for 2020. It's only about a seven barrel blend. We got Nick's Cuvée because that's about, a, it's typically a four barrel blend and we were able to, to get a three barrel blend out of that. We didn't do Ketchum Vineyard. And then what we did, we had about 30 barrels that we were trying to come up with like a, a five clone and trying to come up with something else. And, and but it just didn't work. But we found that as a whole, if you mix those 30 barrels together, it was wonderful, but it wasn't like hmm. anything we've ever produced before because it was, it didn't have the characteristics of the Ketchum Vineyard. It didn't have the old Pomard 4, but we're, we're gonna, we're creating a wine. Um, we have our, our five plant and we're creating a wine that we're calling, um, I think we're gonna use the name Hindsight for it because it was made in 2020 and we're gonna make, it's a little different, but, but this is how we pivoted. This is how we managed to pivot in this difficult year of 2020. And, yeah. and so wow. this, bottled a few weeks ago and I've yet to try the it's bottled version, good. but I think it's going to be really, really good, but it's different. You know, it's, it's perhaps not what it's not this, but it, but it's his own thing. And it's what we were able to, um, to make from, from that vintage. And That's, I do see somewhere in the, in the chat here, someone saying 30 barrels is a lot of wine to blend together. And, and it is, it um, is. we, we produce roughly 2000 to 2,500 
cases of wine, like all together. Mm -hmm. And so for our Pinot program, we're anywhere between 60 to 80 barrels of wine um, of, of Pinot Noir in the cellar. And really what what the deciding factor on how much Pinot we end up with every year is really what the vineyard produces. So right 100%. now, yep. yeah, 2018, we had more grapes than we knew what to do with. And we love our 18. Yeah, I and love it. we're looking at this, this current vintage, it's going to be small and mighty. Um, and so we're kind of, you know, I, I, one of Mark's sayings that he always said and I always loved is at the end of the day, we really are just dirt mm. farmers. Like we like, yeah, it's the it's mother nature that really yeah. like, toes the line for us and tells us what direction we're going to go each and every year. And, and, right. Yeah. And even then, she can still pull a lot of punches and throw some curveballs. Yeah. And Absolutely. California has had we've been in a drought for so long and and Pinot grapes love the struggle. They uh, Pinot. Um, it, I think the best Pinots come from these drought years where there's not a lot of water to help the, the juice along. But but the, what we get is this like excellent concentration. So, so we're on to our, I don't know, sixth year of drought here and our, my lawn is totally brown. We're not watering. We're saving the, the well for the vineyard. We do mostly dry farming, but it's, um, it's, we're just, um, you know, you, you get what you get. And so this year we think it's going to be a light year, but we're confident in, in the quality of it. And last I year, like it. Yeah. I mean, a couple of folks have asked, you know, where is Ketchum? So I'm going to show them that. But uh, Ali, I do want to show you, I'm sure you attended one, two or three of the final Grateful Dead shows in 2015 in San Francisco. You know, I didn't make it to the San Francisco ones, but where did I, I saw them? Um, well, I saw them recently in Pine Knob. No, you, you couldn't have, because if you remember, this was their last show in Chicago in 2015. Oh, so they are yeah. no more. They are no more. Yeah. And fun fact about this show, um, I'm the only one not wearing tie-dye. <laughs> uh, always be marketing. So Seller Angels is here. Perfect. And, perfect. and I had, I had taken the... Shirt. I had taken the month of July off from alcohol, but I can tell you the contact high at this stadium was unbelievable. Oh yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, as it should be. Absolutely. As it should be. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me uh, show folks where we are talking about as it yeah. relates to catching the States. Uh, for those of you that are new to us, this is our playground right here for Cellar Angels. And as I mentioned, since 2010, we have been focused intently on one region only, well, two regions, if you factor it in, one wine region, but two counties, Napa and Sonoma. So for the better part of 12 years, we've filmed over 400 wineries. We've shared their wines with a growing population around the United States uh, because most people recognize that once you start getting a fondness for something, be it Pinot or Ferraris, you really wanna just have the best. And, and this is the playground uh, basically because of the topography, but also because of the soil. It's funny, you just talked about, Mark said, you know, we're tools of the dirt. There is no yeah, dirt yeah. like this in the world. Uh, I mean, it's a Mediterranean climate. Only 3% of the globe has a Mediterranean climate. They have six of 12 soil types in Napa and Sonoma County. So it's a very, very special place when it comes to a tapestry of winemaking potential. Grape growing potential is all here. Uh, the Angels stayed uh, at the Visley property recently, which is a stone's throw from Ketchum. And yes. this is where uh, Allie's residence and winery is. I so, played bocce with um, John Visley last night, <laughs> sidebar. Um, did you kick his butt? Well, he, I was on his team. <laughs> okay. okay. By the way, uh, there's a gentleman on this evening's called Jim B, who the B is a nickname for Bocce. He's a ringer. So be careful when he comes out. Uh, right. Come on out. So, so this is, it, but I, I stopped here on the satellite because you can see the proximity to the Russian River. So, yeah, you know, a river does run through it, a famous movie. Uh, but here is kind of, if you imagine, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years of this overflowing its banks and receding, overflowing its banks. And so you have really, really rich soils uh, of nutrient and different levels of stone. Uh, the beautiful thing about the Russian River is not only the view, but also what you get to see from Ali's backyard, which is over my shoulder. So if, if I zoom in, you know, you can sit on this patio and taste. Yeah. 
which we've done. So check the Seller Angels video with Catching Mistakes. And that's one thing I want to ask, Allie, is how do people taste with you? Well, they they give us a call, text, email, whatever it takes. I'm Allie at Catch em Estate, A-L-L-I-E. And Renee is Renee at Catch em Estate. Or you can text anytime you're in the area. We'd love to have you over. And we just provide a super VIP treatment where you come into our dining room or out on our back deck. I'll take you for a vineyard walk. We can do a lap. You can pet the goats, see the puppies, we have chickens, um, all sorts, a menagerie of animals. Um, and we also have a lovely guest house. So if you give it some time and give us a holler, we'd love to, we'd love to help you with some housing as well. Um, and so it's easy. How, hypothetically, how much time? Um, you know, well, who knows? Depends yeah. on, yeah, it just- Like an hour? I mean, I, I, well, we, we had we had folks stop in. Uh, we had about an hour notice before they today. stopped in today. Before before we joined you yeah, all here, they're like, "Can we bring a um, tasting over at 3 I'm like, "Yeah, but they have to be gone by four thirty." <laughs> so we well, had, and uh, also some of the angels know, and, and more people are gonna know. But if you fly into Santa Rosa's airport, you are ninety seconds from tasting. Oh, I mean, it's you, so easy. It's so easy. It's so yeah. easy, STS. and you guys are you guys are yeah. a few minutes from uh, the airport. But also, we we literally just talked about uh, Lise Asamont and 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 you know Lise is actually not that far away from you, oh, and yeah. also where where Renee grew up, and and one of our I don't know why it was see look that's I'm not where, doing that's where Ali played um, Bocce last night. No, I played at um, back uh, Bacchus Land. Yeah, yes, yeah, Bac yep, yep, exactly Bacchus Landing, which is West. So, so we're yep, east side of the Russian River, and they are west side of the Russian River, and um, and we're both we both grow wonderful Pinot, east and west side. Yeah. So so here's Bacchus Landing, which many of you have heard us talk about. Uh, you know, Kevin Borofsky's there uh, with Montan Roos. We've got Lise Asamont there, Smith Story. There's a bunch of wineries there, but boy, it is just a stone's throw from Renee's hometown of Healdsburg, mm -hmm. uh, which is insane because this is the new probably not so new dining Mecca of wine country. And I'm throwing Napa in there as well, mm -hmm. because this is what Yountville was 20 years ago. And so they have more Michelin stars now, and I'm sure it's probably pricing a lot of locals out of the area. And that's not met with great uh, mm -hmm. praise, but boy, you've got Valette, you've got so many different restaurants in here. Mm -hmm. uh, they just put really in a montage. Easy. Yeah. And I did see Flying Goat has a new location. So I'm very happy about that. Good. Yeah. Get good coffee. Uh, it's important. But if you have the opportunity to stay in wine country, Healdsburg is, is one of the, the places to stay. So I'm curious, tell us about, you just mentioned the case production. What's the future uh, for Catch and Hold? You mentioned yeah. sparkling. So I, I'm yeah, so sparkling. thrilled that you agreed to send everybody a bottle of that. <laughs> Yes, um, signs. Well, <laughs> we just we want to grow. We want to we want to share our love. So I feel like um, I'm just absolutely lucky because I, I I have this product that I can bring to the table and people enjoy it. And I'm all about just sharing it and growing it. So I'm off next week to the um, Baltimore Country Club in Baltimore. We do a lot of wine dinners. So if anyone. Um, out there, um, I we love to travel, and we um, we if you are a member of a club or have a favorite restaurant in your town that likes to put on wine dinners, please reach out to us and connect us to your managers. I feel like that's a real grassroots way yeah. for us and to. We love, we we love going to you know small places. Like yeah. Um, like Spartanburg. I, I know Spartanburg. Yeah. We see our dear friend, <laughs> who is the club manager at the Piedmont Club in you know, Spartanburg, which is annually our one of our, you know, it's our absolute favorite place to visit. They sell out two wine dinners um, in one weekend, which is just, it, it makes my heart sing. And we're kind of, I mean, we're, we really do. We love traveling. We love, um, we, we love, love sharing we love people coming to us, but we also really enjoy and appreciate sharing our wines um, across the country. And in your backyard, if you have wine loving friends, we'll come and we'll bring wine and we can all drink and enjoy that together. So to me, it's just about making the connections and the friendships and the relationships. We, we just returned from Peter joined us on that, a wonderful wine cruise, which, um, which we're in Greece, Greece and Turkey. Key on oceanic cruise lines and we've already set our cruise for next year where we're going to start in Jerusalem and head over to Egypt and Tunisia and Crete 
in uh, Sicily and wind up in Malta. And, and to us, I mean, we're all about adventure. We're all about seeing the world. We're all about drinking wines from different regions than our own. And um, so as far as growing, you know, I, I, I was given this winery or I, you know, Mark, um, I, I inherited or, or am carrying on this winery. And to me, I, I just want to represent it the best way I can and grow it um, and share it and be able to, to give to other communities and give to organizations that are in need, like Sellers Angels. And, and, um, and so if you are a member of a school or a member of a of a, um, a nonprofit, non you have something that's near and dear to your heart. We do love. Um, we love donating, donating a stay at our guest house or donating. Well, that's, I think that's one of the things that is clearly evident is the compassion and heartfelt giving and sharing. And you both know it, uh, Renee, you've lived it since growing up in wine country, but we've said it for years, you know, wine brings people together. It does. And yeah. uh, we we call the Cellar Angels faithful heroes. We don't mean heroes in today's traditional definition, but more the Aristotle definition, because they are defenders uh, and protectors, and they defend and protect the limited production winery. And uh, their number one tool is love. And we need a little bit more of that, because this is really what the community is all about. And great wine tends to make that a lot easier. So you two have been incredibly kind and gracious for spending your Friday afternoon with us. And the wine speaks for itself. The hospitality speaks for itself. And again, SIP episode 106, we couldn't have been happier to have the two of you on it. Thank you. Oh, cheers. cheers to you all. Thank you all. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to seeing cheers. Chad when he gets married here in November. I noticed he was on and that. Was oh, nice. Thing. Jim, yeah. Bill, and Sean, training week has started. Bed check at nine. See you guys on Friday. Cheers. 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 cheers.